you get about the time? I tried once. how we elect our leaders, whether we like it or not. And so we're proud to propose this motion that we believe citizens should have the right to sell their vote, because we believe fundamentally that we're already selling our votes. And I'll get on that in, in our constructive. Our model is going to be simple, of course. People are going to be able to sell their votes for cash that they can check. And we, we can already see this. Uh, this is potentially possible in places like Oregon in the United States, where it's all absentee ballots. People can already check it. You can already go to somebody and say, look, here, you can verify my voting pattern. Uh, and, and we can't really regulate if they uh, show somebody else for cash. Second, you can say that anybody can pay anybody off. That is, a corporation can pay off a person for voting a certain way, or an actual uh, unified campaign can pay, pay uh, an individual to vote a certain way. The last thing we would say is that they would, these these contribute, these uh, payments would of course be taxable and tracked by the uh, requisite electoral commissions like Elections Canada or the Federal Election Commission in the United States. Now, with that, I'm going to talk about three issues today. First, I'm going to talk about the, pervade, uh, the prevalence of money in politics. I'm then going to talk about the uh, presumption in favor of individual trades and contracts. And last, I'm going to talk about the increasing represent representativeness of selling our votes. So first, on the issue of money in politics, I think it's pretty clear that if we just look at just the American election, that there's more money being spent on advertising in this election by one candidate than ever than, than any time in previous history. In fact, the idea, the, the entire reason, the first time in 34 years, 34 years, right, that uh, a person, that a major presidential candidate chose not to take federal election cash was Barack Obama. Why? Because he could raise so much cash. Like the, the idea that there's no money and that money plays no influence in a in political system has no bearing in today's debate. I think we can all recognize that there is some weight in it. Sure. Sir, yes. Tr traditionally, one of the great things of democracy is that the candidate who has the most money doesn't necessarily win the election. You change all that and it's essentially a money raising fee without any aspect of democracy involved. I'd like you to prove to me that the person with the uh, lesser amount of money doesn't win the election. If we go back the last several election cycles, we can look at things like George W. Bush outraising John Kerry by like 40% in the run-up to the primaries, and then distributing that cash to 527 organizations for a coordinated campaign. I think that I think the idea that, that uh, lesser funded people winning elections just doesn't hold any water today. We said there was already a presumption, there's already a proxy vote line with candidates buying huge amounts of advertising, and the ability to fund large get-out-the-vote campaigns, paying field organizers, thousands and thousands of people to go across the country, knock on doors and say, vote for my candidate, vote for the person that's paying cash. Even things like driving people to a voting booth, we think that there's an implicit idea of, you should vote for this candidate, because we're the ones that are taking you to the voting booth. 
I think that there's already this, this prevalence of, of cash in there. And we think that there's just, the last issue is, why not just directly pay people for the votes, rather than going through this song and dance of implicit vote buying, of proxy vote buying. The last issue we talk about on money and politics, we think that there's an inherent check on abuses. Okay? It's not as though you'll be selling your votes every, you know, forever in the future. If someone does something, like say Microsoft continuously buys people who are voting, who want to vote a certain way on an, on an open internet law or something like that, if that angers the populace sufficiently, the next election, they will elect people who will react against that policy. If there is, in democracy, there is an inherent check on concentration of power and this, and this, sort, of, uh, this sort of abuse is noise. Second, we're going to talk about the issue of, of, of individual traits. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a presumption in our society, there's a presumption in liberal societies, that people can sell and people can enter contracts freely and exchange, in, in exchange services for cash or services for services. We don't think that there's anything inherent in your vote that means that you cannot sell it to somebody else or you cannot assign it to somebody else. And even if it's objectionable, ladies and gentlemen, such as prostitution, we would find objectionable, or stripping, we would find as objectionable, we wouldn't necessarily say that there's something that says we can outlaw it outright. We don't think that they can, they, they, we think that the opposition will have to come up and prove to us somehow why this is such a different or important situation, voting. And then they have to prove to us why we shouldn't even have money in politics in the first place. And it should be a blind system where we just have uh, big paragraphs of election votes. We think that there's this presumption of allowing people the autonomy to do what they will with, what they, with the talents they possess or with their endowments. And voting definitely in a liberal democracy is an endowment. Before I get on to the last point, sure. But sir, with ads and in campaign financing in that sense, we actually get insight into the party's policies and stuff. That's why it's valuable as opposed to straight up buying the vote, would you agree? Yeah, but the issue here is, like, no, this, this, this goes into my third point, but it's not as though someone's going to like just go and sell their vote to whoever they want or the first person to ask for their vote. We think that, uh, remember this in, in 15 seconds. We think that on my third point, that this actually increases uh, uh, representation uh, because of the lack of representation already. We see already there's a problem in getting the number of registered voters out to polls. We see in the last several election cycles, the number of people who actually voted uh, was something like 70% in Canada. It was very, very low. My roommate was drinking on the night of the election and couldn't believe what was what happened there. Ladies and gentlemen, we think that there's already an inherent problem of unrepresentativeness. People who don't buy into the system or people who just feel like the, the system or the candidates don't represent them and don't represent their views. We think, ladies and gentlemen, that when there are two candidates who are buying for your vote and offering cash, an individual voter is not going to sell to the first person that offers them cash, they'll think, hmm, both candidates are offering me money, and I will choose the one that I like the best. So what happens here is, rather than not going to vote and your preferences being ignored, if you sell your vote to the candidate you like the best, we think that there is an increase in your representative and in representation for you in the total number of votes that are cast. Because if you're leaving for Barack Obama, but for whatever reason you just can't get away from work to vote for Barack Obama, you can sell your vote, and then your voice is heard in that situation. And the converse is true for McCain or Harper or Dion, whatever you, whatever you, whoever you want to put in there. Second, we think that this allows for an, incre an increased reflection of, of marginal support. That one vote, ladies and gentlemen, equals 100% support for a certain candidate. Whereas if you have a ranked system on number of dollars uh, for a candidate, we think that there's a, there's a likelihood, we can see, we can, that reveals a preference for marginal support for a candidate. We think that that is more representative or provides more information on how the people support the candidates. Ladies and gentlemen, money's in politics, we might as well just make it direct. For these reasons, we're proud to propose. <laughs> Is. 
First of all, we can say that a vote is a right. Right? We recognize that like, suffrage, as it has been given to people, as it has been, uh, as people have been enfranchised, is a right and not a privilege. Right? We think that when something is right, it is intrinsic. We think that I can't sell my right to food. Right? We think it's just something that you have, something that is part of like your uh, your kind of like social contract. Let's say that, um, and it's something that you can't sell. We think that a right in and of itself is not like a tangible product that can be exchanged for money. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing that we think is that like it helps with the functions of government. This idea of like what is the government supposed to do, right? So that's like the next two of like the next two things I'm gonna talk about, like what a vote is, right? We think that a government has to have representative power, and government also has to have like practical power to make policies, right? We think that in the first case, with representative power, by selling your vote, what you're essentially doing is you're giving away your chance to have your interests, your needs, and your voice represented in government. You're basically giving up your say. We think this is both bad for the individual who's no longer being representative, but it's also bad for the government that can no longer legitimately fulfill their role of representation um, and legitimately ful fulfill that function. Right? Well, the next idea is this like practical aspect, right? So when you vote, you're voting to elect a leader that will then have control over the practical policies that affect your day-to-day -day life. Right? We think that like, first of all, it's very important to represent your interests and your needs and have a say in the type of leader that's going to be deciding practical policies, things that will actually affect you. And second of all, we think that like, the reason why we have in place a system of like, one vote per person is this idea of like, broad representation, that it's not just one demographic, in this case, the people that are rich enough to buy the votes that are being represented. Right? Mm -hmm. Why is that important? We think that it's particularly important when it comes to like, a leader being able to have this kind of power to implement policies mm -hmm. because of legitimacy, right? We think that like, when you're only representing one demographic, when you are not having a broad representation, what you're essentially doing is you're, uh, you're eroding the legitimacy of this leader. We think that that's a problem because we think legitimacy is where the power of any given political leader uh, derives from, right? So we think this is actually very problematic. Yes? Do you think there's actual broad representation when only 75 to 80 percent of the registered electorate turns out okay, to vote? Okay, thank you very much, right? But like under your model, it's not like you're getting more representation of like different people or like actually increasing the number of people that are coming out and being represented. All you're doing is like the people that already vote will get to vote again. Right? So like, you're not having a broader representation at all. Okay? So the next question I want to look at is this idea of like, what does someone do? And I have four things that I'm going to say this does. First of all, because it sets a very dangerous precedent that rights are not inalienable, and that if you can pay enough money, that they can be sold. We don't think that's a good thing. We don't think that we should be encouraging this idea that like rights are something that if you can pay enough, they, uh, they can be taken away. That is. Right? The second idea is, like, as I said, the government doesn't fulfill their duty of like, representing the power. Right? Like they're not actually representing their citizens, they're representing one demographic in society, and we don't think that that's what the government should be doing. And finally, as I said, this idea of like, it erodes the legitimacy of the office, right? We think like, if you look at case studies and case examples of uh, different leaders in the world, one of the major problems is legitimacy, right? Like, Mugabe, for example, is a great example in Zimbabwe, and this, right? This idea of like, legitimacy is one of these major obstacles to actually being able to like, uh, put these kind of, like, have power derived from I'm using legitimacy a lot, but like have power derived from a place where you can actually perform these things and not be seen as corrupt and not have like massive opposition. We think that like accepting policies is very much linked to this idea of legitimacy. We think that comes from being a broad representative of society, not just like representing the rich. Now, the final is this idea of like the practical problem with this, right? Because we would say that the people that are going to sell their votes are the poor people. We would say that that is the last group that you want to encourage to lose the representation. Why is that the case, right? We're gonna say that poor people, they, they are the ones that are actually like affected by a lot of the socioeconomic policies that are going folks, right? And the government is particularly responsible for socioeconomic policies. That is a particular focus, right? So we think that when you take the people that are most affected by the policies that the government comes up with, and you take away the representation, what you're essentially doing is ensuring that like, you're ensuring that the people who are not as much affected, the richer people, by economic policy are now the ones that have a say or the people that are actually affected, right? Because we think that the middle class, poorer people are the ones that very often get hit very hard by the economic backlashes in society, right? Like we can see in the States, for example, right, um, with the economic problems going there, people that are getting hit the hardest are people that are poor and the middle class. It's not the rich class that can afford to buy the votes that really need this representation, right? I think representation correlates to policy, no thanks. Okay, so what did you hear from proposition, right? First of all, we're gonna take issue with their model right away. They didn't say like who is buying these things. Like, is it an individual? Is it a party? If it is a party, then we have.
have this problem with like a party being able to hijack the election, right? Because like if one party is more rich than another party, all they have to do is just go and like buy up as many votes as they possibly can, and now this party has essentially like self left itself. So I think that that's problematic. No thanks, right? We also like we heard this idea of like, in their model of like, look, anybody can pay off anybody right now, right? That may be the case, but we don't think that legitimizing it and like making it legal lot uh, legalizing it is a good idea, right? We think that like if somebody is doing this kind of like fraud with voting, they should be like treated and punished accordingly. We don't think that we should say, yeah, yeah, that's okay. No thanks. Okay, right. And they also have this idea of like, look, if you're gonna sell your vote, then and this leads me to my rebuttal, right? Because I actually I'll go in order. Let's let's talk about the first one. This idea of like money in politics, right? They challenge us to say, like, you need to prove that money doesn't have a place in politics. No, we don't. We don't need to say that money doesn't have politics. What we need to say is that money doesn't have a, uh, doesn't have a place in a vote, right? Like that's our burden. I think I've shown to you already why it shouldn't be there, right? We think it's very different from advertising or campaigning because, like, advertising or campaigning is influence, it's putting out information, but the choice remains in the hand of the voter. Like they can choose what they want to do. We think that that's very different than taking their vote away from them and actively like um, taking away this choice. Okay. The next thing we heard is this idea of like individuals, right? Like we like they basically told us to come up here and say what is different about voting than any other service or any other game path. I think I've already presented to you my concern for representation, why like voting is an inherent right, and more importantly, it the representation that voting uh, gives to a, a citizen is directly correlated to the policies that, that affect their life. We think it's extremely different, right? And finally we heard this idea of representation, this idea that like if you if you care, you're gonna like try and get the candidate, you're going to sell it to the candidate that you actually care about, right? We would say if you care, you're not going to sell your vote, and if you do want to sell your vote, your main motive is money. For all these reasons, you can
party they like the best. And we're going to tell you on our side of the house that it's better to have those people come out and make that choice regardless of their incentive for coming to the voting booth because they're still reflecting in some measure their personal preference for doing that. Go. Okay, but certainly under your model, like an individual can buy someone's vote without telling them where they're going to vote or who they're going to vote for, and then do, like no, no, like you can't, party you, party. you can't do that because like the model that we had was like I can pay you to write a particular name on your ballot, and we talked about the case of Oregon where they mail you your ballot, and you're like, hey, I'm going to write communist, and then they give you the money. So like, yeah, you're not you're not giving them a blank check. I thought that was fairly clear. You're just you're you're telling them who they're voting for there. Um, okay. The next, the last constructive point I'd like to make briefly is why it's better to do it this way. Because what we see is already big companies can try to influence the outcome of an election or, or try to influence policy. But the way that they do that is by making contributions to political candidates and making contr contributions to interest groups that then lobby on their behalf. But the problem with that is that the check on that is the politician's discretion about what crosses the line and what kinds of things should be supported. We think that's problematic because we think it's better to put that decision in the hands of the public, the voters. So if the Nazi party wants to offer me a bribe to vote for them, I won't take it. That's a decision that we think the electorate as a whole, as a whole should be empowered to make for themselves, which kind of, of firms to take bribes from. Also, that way the electorate gets the money, which is nice for the electorate, instead of it going to the politicians. We think it's better to distribute money among poor people than among rich politicians. Sit down. Okay. I'd like to get into some reputation because I think they did say some very interesting but very flawed things. They said, firstly, a vote is an inalienable right and you can never sell it, just like you can never sell food. And I said, what? You can sell food all the time, but moreover, you can sell lots of inalienable rights. I can sell my right to speech by serving as a lobbyist or serving as an attorney. You can sell your right to, to, to mobility by agreeing to move to a certain place. We allow individuals to forego rights, for instance, non-competitive uh, contracts where you say, I won't work in that jurisdiction. We allow individuals to surrender their personal liberty at their discretion. This isn't coercive. This is an agreement to use your own liberty in a certain way. We have no qualms whatsoever with that in our society. The next thing they said is, it's bad to give up your say. Well, we're saying people still have their say in the sense that they're still choosing who to vote for and from whom to take money. We think that if you if th th that still retains the fact that they're still making that choice, even if it's incentivized on the margin. Now, sure, like if you were going to tell a homeless guy, I'll give you a million dollars, then they, he might not have it. He might be economically coerced. But we don't think you're in a position where you can bribe people to an economically coercive extent. Like there's millions of voters. You're just not going to have enough money. Okay. The, the, the next thing is they said, it's bad not to have broad representation. We say, it's good to have broader representation when you encourage more people to get into the voting booth. <laughs> then they talked about some of the consequences that they asserted would occur. And they said, this is going to undermine the legitimacy of government. But we see in lots of political systems where there's like blatant campaign contributions where you can look at that senator and be like, that senator is in the pocket of the oil industry, and yet people still abide by the laws passed by those jurisdictions. We would say people in society are willing to accept this money. It doesn't actually undermine legitimacy. And moreover, when there's the check of individual choice on the part of the electorate, whether or not to take contributions, we would say that's a better preservation of that kind of legitimacy. Then they said, oh no, the poor will be victimized to leave them with giving up their vote. If they're not voting anyway, if, if, if it's people who wouldn't vote otherwise, then it's great that they're coming to the polling station and they're not really losing anything salient. Okay, then they said, who's buying? The parties will buy the elections. But what we would tell you is, when you look at instances where like, the Republican Party had an advantage historically in terms of the amount of fundraising they had, and people didn't like it, so they donated lots of money to the other parties. What we can see is there's a corrective effect here, where people in society care about particular issues. They'll contribute in order to offset the other guys. The difference here is that instead of the funds being, in a way, wasted on like, advertising and stuff that's kind of useless in many cases. This is a direct transfer into people's pockets. That's what it gives them a, a, an actual benefit. And then they said, well, you're coercing people to give up their vote, vote. And I'd say, you're not coercing somebody when you offer them 20 bucks to vote for the other guy. Madam Speaker, what we have told you is that we've got a presumption in our society where individuals see it in their best interest to do something, we allow them to take payment for doing it. They haven't given you a compelling reason we should have bridged that right here.
boils down to the following. We've heard from side proposition this idea that, that money already controls votes to a certain extent. And we will agree on side opposition that if I have a $3 billion campaign versus a $5 campaign, that the $3 billion campaign is probably likely to get more votes than a $5 campaign in like equal circumstances. We'll agree on that. But we haven't really heard why strengthening the link in between money and democracy and votes is a good thing, right? And that's what we're going to do, except we're going to say that it's a bad thing. So they haven't really said, like, oh, this money democracy link is a good thing, so like, let's make it better, because that's what they have to do. We have to make this stronger, right? Because it's more direct in their words, right? We're going to say that by making it more direct, we cause a whole bunch of problems, and that's really, really bad for our democracy as a whole, okay? We don't want to strengthen that link. And my point is called aristocracy and democracy. Why a more direct link is harmful. Okay, so what this resolution does is it gives money to the wealthy. Or sorry, it gives power to the wealthy. If I have more money, I now have more democratic power. Thank you. Um, and also, like, don't say stuff when you stand up on video. I can see. Okay. Um, okay. So anyway, um, it gives more. It gives more power to the wealthy. So if I have more money, I can afford to buy more votes. If I have less money, I can't afford to buy more votes, and I'm more susceptible to selling my vote because I need money. So why is that problematic? But well, we don't actually think that people in society right now have money necessarily for the right reasons, right? So now we're that we're linking like power and democratic choice with money, we think that like because you have money doesn't mean you should have control over society. The thing that we do think you should have control over society based on is if you exist as a human being, if you live in society, that people should all have an equal amount of vote. We haven't heard from side proposition, and that's what they had to do um, and, and tell us, you know, I, I, you know, they had to come up and tell you that, you know, this is a good thing, this link is a good thing, that money should influence more directly than it already does. They said it, they almost illustrate that it's problematic the degree in which it affects it now, and they're simply strengthening that link. We think that that's problematic. Okay, so we don't think that like wealthy people, status quo, actually already have more democratic power. They can have more campaign financing. They you know, they have um you know they have more democratic power even like with with their money by spending their dollar. Economists will say like you vote with your dollar. So already wealthier people have more money or more democratic power. We think that this exacerbates the problem of inequality in democracy. We think that it exacerbates the problem of wealthy people having more democratic power by more directly giving them more democratic power. We think that that's very, very problematic. And the point of a government is to represent its society. And the people that they are most usually representing, what Nicole said, and they even really deal with, is the idea that they're representing poor people, the marginalized people, the people most likely to sell their votes, right? And these people are going to be underrepresented under the system proposed by side proposition simply because they are more susceptible to sell their vote. Now, side proposition, the response to this was, well, they don't vote anyway. That's not true. <coughs> lots and lots of poor people vote. And lots and lots of poor people will now sell their vote to rich persons who vote um, for them. Now, they had this idea. They had this idea that, like, no, 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 the poor people will agree. They'll say, like, okay, look, look okay, promise me Bill Gates. Vote for the NDP because that's what I want to vote for. Give me 15 bucks and vote for the NDP for me. We don't think that makes sense. First of all, we haven't heard a model. Like, do they get the